Welcome to the first episode of the Real Talk on Women's Health podcast with Essentia Health. I am your host, Lauren Wells, and I have two guests in studio for this first episode. I have Dr. Jonathan Knight, a board-certified pediatrician with Essentia Health, and we also have a mom in studio, Lacey. Thank you both for being here. Let's start by talking about taking your kids to the doctor. Now, I'm not a parent myself, but I've always wondered how often should parents be taking their babies to the doctor for the first, let's say, five years of their life? Yeah, so we actually have a pretty set schedule um, for the first several years. You know, we want to see children right away after they're born within the first couple days, sometimes even like the next day, depending on what's going on in the hospital, if there's jaundice or feeding concerns and stuff. And then depending on how your kid is doing, we'll see him back at a two week check. And then if doing well, then it's uh, two months. And then we go every two months until six months. And then every three months until 18 months or one and a half and then every six months until three and then after three it's every year so and all our vaccine schedules are kind of built on that uh, on that timing as well so if you're following the standard vaccine schedule which we recommend it makes it easy for coming in for those checks what would you suggest for like I know once kids get into preschool a lot of things go around you know when should parents bring their kids in if they're concerned yeah I mean it, it really depends on what's going on with the child. If you have a fever, but you're playful and, you know, not coughing too bad, no trouble breathing. You know, if you have a fever and cough, still recommend doing a COVID test, but probably wait on it a little bit, depending what's happening. You know, a lot of families are worried about strep at some point. Um, That usually presents without cold symptoms. So if it's just a sore throat, headache, vomiting, fever, sometimes you have some, you can feel some bumps in your neck, in your child's neck or a rash. That sounds like strep. But if you have a runny nose and cough, a lot of times it's not. And we don't recommend testing for strep if you have those things going on too. You know, I probably wouldn't let a kid have a fever more than five days without bringing them in. And again, it's what's going on. You know, is do you feel like your kid's getting better? Are things getting worse? And a lot of that can be, you can sort that out by giving our office a call. Our nurse line will help you decide, is it time to come in or not? Um, And that's really, really helpful for families. When is the appropriate time to give your child like ibuprofen or Tylenol? Yeah, great question. So a fever in itself is not a big deal. A fever just tells you that your child's immune system is working. You know, the purpose of fever is to speed up all the little tiny chemical reactions in your body to make them more efficient. Um, so in, in a sense, your body is working better for fighting infection when you have a fever. Downside to that is you feel cruddy. You know, if you think about how the body is designed, you feel cruddy because you don't want to be doing anything. You want to rest and get better. So it's really, I, I usually say treat a fever if your child's acting like they feel sick. If they're hot and happy don't worry i mean obviously you want to keep an eye on it but i wouldn't worry as much and i wouldn't treat it i would never wake up a sleeping kid if they feel hot now there are some sometimes you need to that's a little different you know some kids have seizures when they have a high fever and uh, they're not worrisome usually doesn't mean they have epilepsy but in those situations your doctor will probably say treat your kid as soon as you feel like they have a fever and that might stop them from having a seizure but other than that you can just kind of use your judgment if they're feeling gross treat it. If they're, you know, hot and happy, don't worry about it. I feel growing up, my mom was always like, here, you don't feel good. Have time to ibuprofen. And then <laughs> like becoming a parent and doing a little bit of research and you're like, okay, actually the fevers help battle what the virus they have. And so you don't necessarily want to just give them time on ibuprofen. Mm-hmm. What about like teething too? Because yeah. I feel like, is it, is it a misconception that they get a fever when they're teething? Because I've heard some people say like, oh, that's not true. But then it just always seems to kind of like happen too. Or is it just a coincidence that they probably have a virus at the same time. It's probably coincidental. Um, This is actually studied, like what are the most common symptoms when kids have teething? And what I recall from the study is mild temperature elevations are, they happen, but not true fever. So if you're running more than 100.3, probably not teething or teething alone. Could be teething and you're also sick, but um, yeah, fever is not in general because you're teething. So what are your thoughts on medication? for when they're yeah. teething because if they seem to be like super fussy oh, yeah. pain, uncomfortable. Yeah, teething hurts. I mean, it, it's every kid get. I mean, almost every kid. Some kids don't have teeth, but most kids do and it doesn't feel good. I think Tylenol or ibuprofen for comfort for, you know, and, and I did this with my own kids for a week or so at bedtime. It helps them sleep better. It's great. You're not giving them too much. You're not doing it around the clock. That's not really going to harm them. Um, and if it helps you get a few more hours of sleep, I 
think that's a win. Things I, I don't recommend though are 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 things like Oragel. They do make an infant Oragel, but I always worry that you might not get the right one. So Oragel, uh, its main main ingredient is is a is a drug called benzocaine, and in young children that's poisonous. Um, it can cause a very serious life threatening condition um, called methemoglobinemia of a little blood disorder, but it, it's it's a poison. So I really recommend against Oragel and numbing creams and stuff like that. Things I didn't know. Right. Um. What about, I see too, they have those like little like dissolving tablets now. Is sure. I don't know too. Sure. So it, it's probably not going to help. So those things are are called homeopathic remedies and essentially they're, they're like sugar tabs. So there's not any strong evidence that those are helpful. If anything, I would let your kid, you know, depending on the age, chew on a cold rag, get one of those little silicone teething things that you could put some frozen breast milk in or formula or other food like cereal or food that they're having so they can chew on those uh, without a choking hazard. That generally works just as good as anything else. Okay. So not to completely switch topics, but since you brought up breastfeeding. Yeah. So I'm still breastfeeding. Awesome. And Otis is nine months. I want to start kind of weaning myself off just because I'm not getting sleep at night. Right. But I mean, what's the whole guidelines with that now? And yeah. can you start giving them, like, if if I dried out, is it worth being like, oh, formula for a month? Or do you start doing whole milk? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't consider whole milk nutritionally sufficient by itself until you're close to a year of age. And, and that being said, it's not the only thing you can drink. You have to be eating food. If you just drink whole milk and you don't eat anything else, your child will be very malnourished. And that's true for anything after about six or seven months of age. Your child needs to be getting other things things than just breast milk or formula. So in your situation, the recommendations are breastfeed as long as you can, right? But I also recognize that there's a lot of external factors that uh, compete against your ability to successfully breastfeed that long. You have a job. um, You might not be able to pump at work. You're not sleeping, right? There's a lot of sleep. Sleep Sleep is everything, (laughs) right? So it's it's okay if you don't make it that long. I I think that's something that I, I try really hard to be honest with families about that yeah I mean the guidelines say you need to breastfeed for X amount of time but formula works great some moms can't breastfeed doesn't make them bad moms right that's really important to recognize and to acknowledge to clear the air about that because I, there's so much pressure right now from other moms mothers-in-laws whatever to breastfeed it might not be your reality and that's okay well that kind of leads me to this thing I always hear about I'm not a mom but like the whole mom guilt or even just parent guilt of parents feel guilty if they can't, you know, maybe breastfeed for a long time or even if they just need a little more time to themselves. What would you recommend for parents that are feeling that way? I'm sure, Lacey, you've probably felt that way at some time. Like, I just wish I had 20 minutes just to myself. Yeah, take that 20 minutes and be kind to yourself. I think that's the most important thing. Kids are so resilient. It's hard to mess up, even though you feel like you're messing up all the time. And as a dad, I feel like I'm messing up all the time. But my kids are okay. You know, it's hard. It's hard to really mess it up. I have some like friends that suffer from anxiety and depression and like their worry is like passing that down to their children. Yeah. Do you think that is kind of like, what would you say hereditary or is that a thing or is that something that you're kind like you develop? I think it's probably both. Um, There's probably genetic factors. I mean, we know that there's a lot of many, many diseases have a a genetic basis and you're, there's increased risk if you have a family history. But in kids, a lot of a lot of how we deal with emotions going forward is also learned. Um, there's these things in our in young kids' brains, especially called mirror neurons, um, that actually kind of copy what you see. So copy the feelings. So if you're demonstrating that you're sad, your kid will feel sad. Um, and it's how we learn. So to, to your point, and, and this probably won't help an anxious parent or depressed parent parent feel better, but part of how you interact with the world and handle your own feelings, your child will see that too. So it's really important to focus on yourself as well and to take care of yourself to help deal with depression and anxiety so that your child will learn these coping skills as well, because they'll copy you. They'll, they'll see, they see everything you do and um, you need to be aware of that. You know, and they've always said it takes a village, right? Oh yeah. And I feel like nowadays our village has become part of our screen and our tablets and our TVs. What kind of a 
effect are you seeing on that with kids? I mean, we all know how addictive social media is. It's designed to be that way. And I know uh, this is something I struggle with sometimes too, where I'm on my phone and I really should probably put it away, right? That this is something that my own internal parent guilt tells me all the time. I think having, having support of others is helpful, but to a point, right? I mean, if you have someone that's telling you 24 seven that you need to do it this way, when there's actually like 10 different ways to do this thing that they're telling you to do that are all equally valid, it can really skew how you feel about yourself when you're not successful or you don't follow through with that. And that, I mean, that's the problem with social media in general, right? You have all these people saying like, this is how their lives are and your life is not like that. So do you feel left out? Um, A lot of people do. I mean, my kids obviously aren't on social media, right? But is like, you know, there's studies out there saying like, oh, watching Blippi, now kids have ADHD or there's too much colors and noises and things going on. Sure. Like, is that is that necessarily true? Or is it like, no, it's fine. Like we all, I mean, this is how you work. This is how you learn. Kids have computers coming home with them now to learn. Like, yeah. is it something, is it a learned behavior that's okay or? So I, I think sometimes when you have repeated things that you're ha- that are happening, stimuli that you're seeing on a screen that happen very fast and very often can train your brain to expect that and to only want and to have a very short attention span. So, you know, it makes sense to me if studies are supporting that. No, I'm, I haven't read any right now, but that doesn't mean they're not there, right? I shouldn't even say studies. Social media tells me this. <laughs> oh, sure. Right, right. But I'm I'm sure this is a studied thing, right? I just need, I need to look. I don't have that much time to read all the literature right. and the newest things, but it makes sense to me if that creates a problem. Um, How do you know if it creates a problem though? You know, like right? I mean, my child's too. And if my husband was gone on vacation for eight days, so it was just me and the two boys. And it's like, there's certain things I have to do with the younger one where I'm like, okay, you can, you know, watch mom's phone for a little bit. Yeah, He's yeah. not, it's weird because he doesn't like TVs, but he wants a phone. Right. He likes a phone. Right. And is it because he sees me on a phone? Like, or he can control it a little bit. He can, it's, I think for sure a control thing because yeah. he doesn't even like, it's like YouTube kids, right? I know how to switch. Oh like, man, you know. YouTube. Yeah, YouTube will suck your, suck you in and your children in. I think it's it's really important to do your best to try to minimize screen babysitter time is what I like to call it, um, for lack of a better term. But I also acknowledge that it happens and it's okay if it happens, but you don't want to do it all the time, Yeah. right? You need to have anything in moderation, right? You need to have your kid uh, and yourself, right? It's okay to be bored. That's when you start using your imagination, solving problems problems in creative ways, just thinking about other stuff. That's okay. Um, and that's important. So recognizing and resisting the temptation to throw a, a screen at your kid when they say they're bored is important. Now, as a parent, I understand that's hard. I'm not always really good at that. And that's um, okay too, right? The other thing I wanted to touch on was like tantrums. Yeah. Any like support or advice on tantrums? Oh man. And maybe just like how <laughs> obviously like relatable it probably is and that it's okay to like have your child have a tantrum but it's yeah. really hard on the parents. It is it is because you know sometimes you get I mean I, I've experienced this where I start to feel mad at my child's behavior. I think it's important to call out that you're not necessarily mad at your kid you're mad at what they're doing in the behavior right. Tantrums honestly are just like an explosion of huge feelings. A lot of children who have tantrums are at a developmental age, anything that they f- they can control and they find that they can't unexpectedly leads to a tantrum. And sometimes people, you know, the classic thing is like they're trying to get attention and, and get what they want and stuff like that. Honestly, it's a feeling thing. Like they really feel rage that their chicken nugget fell on the floor and they can't eat it. Like that is straight up rage. And I think again, back to the mirror neuron thing, I think it's, a, it's important to keep in mind and think about this ahead of time, right? Because when you're in the moment and things are heated, you're not really thinking clearly. Neither is a child with a tantrum. They are not, you can't reason with with anyone who's really emotionally upset. So you need to think about it ahead of time and try to maintain your composure 
I think it's really important to acknowledge the emotion that's happening um, so the child feels validated that they have these feelings, but also help provide a calming presence to help them regulate their emotions. If you get heated and are kind of angry too, it's only teaching your child that it's not helping your child learn to how to calm down, you know, and if you're coming at them like you need to just go on time out and you have an angry sounding voice again it doesn't help them calm down it becomes punitive and that punishment for their feelings i think is wrong it's not the feeling you're trying to change you're trying to change the behavior so really think in your mind how to separate those two will help you go a long way yeah but again easier said than done. <laughs> so i kind of want to pop in here and just ask like in your day-to-day life obviously as a pediatrician what's like the number one question that parents ask you that you could just say you know right now and maybe help an out, out another parent that's thinking about the same question. Boy, that's tough. I mean, I I hear different questions all the time. Sleep is a big one. So a lot of kids or a lot of families hear from others that, oh, my child should be sleeping through the night by X amount of time or, oh man, we're in the sleep regression or whatever. There's something wrong because my child's not sleeping. It's not always true. Kids in general, especially breastfed kids, I mean, they're, they're, there's a comfort aspect to eating. Your stomach empties quicker with breast milk than other foods and, and it's, it's a bonding thing. So breastfed kids typically wake up as long as they're breastfeeding. That's a fact. It's rare that I have a family whose kid is nursing and sleeps through the night always. It's always cyclical. It comes and goes. You have teething or you get sick or your family goes on a trip and the environment's messed up. Sleep is going to go out the window with that. That's normal. I think there's a lot of misconstrued ideas that your child needs to sleep through the night. It's it's so awesome when that happens. Well, and think about yourself as an adult. Do you go to bed at nine and then not wake up a single time until 6.30 a.m.? Right. Like, it's just not a thing, I don't think. But. Right. You're up. And I mean, a lot of times as an adult. And if you do, bless you. I know, I know. <laughs> I've never had that. Yeah. So it's just not realistic. I mean, a lot of a lot of people have unrealistic expectations of how their life should be with the child. And sometimes you need a reality check. And hopefully your doctor can help you identify what you really should be focusing on and what it's okay to let go of. That's a good point because I feel like it's hard for parents to let go of maybe a plan that they have in their head, especially with like their first kid, you know, like they want things done a certain way, maybe it doesn't happen. So that's good advice to like give yourself some grace and focus on what you can change. You know, you can't change your child waking up a few times in the night. Yeah, I see that all the time between kids. Like the first kid is very everyone because you haven't done it before. So you have all these kind of plans and ideals in your mind of how it's going to be 99.9% of the time it's not what you think it's going to be right I think this goes back to like giving birth to like exactly hospitals are always like well what's your, your birth, birth plan, plan. Like, why would you even give this to me like, right I, I went and I was like I have zero because I know that anything can happen yeah but I'm like every appointment it was like let's talk about your birth plan and I'm like what I think it's crazy yeah. to me that people push that or in that that's on social media too right like, I just am like it's, it's like it sets you up to fail, right? Yes, ex- yeah. absolutely. And, it's and then like, you feel like a failure. Yes. And then if it didn't it, go as planned or, uh, you know, you forgot your playlist that yeah. you spent all this time making or whatever the case may be. And then your parent guilt fairy gets more fuel and you feel awful. You just kind of have to roll with it. And second ch- children, and even with my own experience, you kind of do. Yeah, you know what to expect, what's reality and what's not, and you have a better understanding of normalcy. Um, that being said, things happen all the time that you can't expect or that that you haven't encountered before and that's where other people are here to help you out but I think it's important to have realistic expectations. Do you feel like in your appointments you're on like a time crunch? Like sometimes I feel like I don't get to actually have a conversation with my doctor like it's so like in and out. Sometimes and you know this this also depends on who you see, their comfort level, their personal style that kind of thing and that that's really important with finding a doctor for your children call out to family practice right like there's family practice is fantastic and can take care of your whole family. If that's your choice, like that's awesome. And they do a really good job. So you don't have to see a pediatrician, right? You know, there might be some conditions that your family practitioner, if you're seeing them might say, you know, maybe we should talk to a pediatrician about this and get their input. But whether or not you see a pediatrician or not is is just fine. Sometimes, yeah, there is a time crunch. We might know someone's on our schedule or waiting that's really sick or has something going on. Or a lot of times we're running behind when we come in. And I understand even as myself as a patient, 
I know that that's frustrating because my time is valuable too, but almost always it's because your doctor is taking care of someone else that needs that time. And I always try to, you know, give my patients a heads up like, hey, I'm running a little behind. I'm sorry. I'll be with you as soon as I can, but I'm taking care of this thing. And I want to make sure that they know that if their child has a serious thing, I will give them all the time they need to get a plan together. So really depends on your doctor. You know, some doctors are better at that than others for sure. I want to shift gears for a minute and kind of touch on teenagers. Like, is there anything that parents can do to prep for when their kids become teenagers? I know it's kind of a scary thought at times. Yeah, teens are teens are challenging. You know, it's it's a big time in your life. You're trying to figure out who you are. You're trying to figure out what makes you tick. And, you know, you're constantly comparing yourself to other people and trying to form lasting relationships, which may not go right. Um, and a lot of mistakes are made. You know, my kids aren't teenagers yet either. So this is something that might evolve. My advice is probably going to evolve with time as I have more practical experience. But I think the most important thing for having a teenager is make sure that they know they are loved unconditionally and that, yes, you acknowledge they're going to make mistakes. That's how they'll learn. But they're not, you know, it's your job as a parent to make sure that those mistakes don't lead them into the ditch. You know, you're going to have a kid that's just thinking about a a metaphor of driving on the road. Teenagers are going to swerve. They might have a few bumps in the road. They might even crash sometimes, but you really don't want them to have that life-threatening collision. And making sure that they know they're unconditionally loved is probably the most important thing you can do for your teen to help them feel grounded and supported when they make those mistakes. So they'll still come back to you and feel supported when they make those mistakes. Maybe just to, to end it out with schools and daycares and everyone always kind of being sick. Do you have any tips or anything to like make that better? This year has been particularly hard because we're kind of running on back to how we, how, how kids would present or come in uh, prior to the pandemic. Masking really works well to prevent a lot of disease. And we were very slow the last few years in terms of seeing sick kids, not as many, just it wasn't happening. Um, but now that everyone's kind of full bore, usually not masking and, and doing everything. And thankfully we have vaccines and, and people are doing much better for the most part. Kids are back to getting back to back viruses, sometimes almost all year. It's pretty common. I have kids come in and we talk about, yeah, they're just always sick. And I'm like, okay, well, what's going on? Well, they had a fever two weeks ago and then they got better, but then they didn't completely get better. And now they have a cough again and the runny nose is back. And I'm like, I think you have another virus. That's normal. And a lot of people's immune systems where typically you're exposed to these things kind of continually. So you build up a, a gradual immune response. There are some kids that because of the pandemic didn't really experience all that when they were toddlers because they weren't necessarily in daycare or they, they just weren't getting exposed to all these things at that time. So now it's all happening right now. So all the viruses and stuff that a kid probably would have been immune to at this age, they just haven't seen yet. It's not that their immune systems are weak, that they didn't get any, they didn't get used during the pandemic. It's just that they haven't seen these viruses yet. So I bet you next year is going to be a lot better. Kids, yes, you're still going to get sick. You're still going to get back to back colds, but I don't think it's going to be as uh, severe as what people are experiencing right now. Like the very early and pretty bad RSV outbreak we had in the fall. That was unusual. Most of the time RSV we see throughout the winter months through March and stuff. And a lot of older kids don't get it and and are as affected as much because they had it when they were babies, but they didn't during the pandemic. So they had it all at the same time in October. So different. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe these patterns of disease of illness and typical child illnesses will shift as things progress in our end of or post pandemic, new pandemic, whatever we want to call it where we're at now. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fun and interesting time to take care of kids for sure. But yeah, chances are your child uh, is just getting back to back illnesses. And if you're worried about that, come talk to us and we'll help you decide, you know, is this really what we think it is or is there something else? There could be something else, but nine times out of 10, it's back to back illness. You can always ask your pediatrician. No question is a dumb question. I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. that's helpful. Well, Dr. Jonathan Knight, pediatrician with Essentia Health. Thank you so much. You bet. Thanks. We'll see you for the next episode of the Real Talk on Women's Health podcast with Essentia Health.